to know like the deeper deets um you can check out either his or my channel we both uh, have it uploaded i think he's still in the process of like uploading those videos to his channel but they're they're on both basically so okay um well so yeah uh, i mean i did a debate last night that was bizarre um okay. so, so there were some interesting questions I guess interesting is one word to use from there, but I guess the question I I struggle with is like, you know, I I've done a lot of Ken Hovind videos, obviously, and you know, he always mm -hmm. says like, um, oh, like how'd you get from a whale to, or an amoeba to a whale? Um, which, you know, obviously he's misrepresenting that, but if 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 you were to steel man that question, like think of think of it as like a question that was actually accurate, like not sure. a, not an amoeba, because a unicellular organism to yeah. complex multicellular organisms. Yeah, like a modern one. Sure. Like that's what I wonder about. Like the what are like like the actual like individual steps, and like that's what I yeah. sort of struggle with because the process is so gradual. It's hard for me to wrap my head around it. Yeah, that's and I mean that's kind of the great thing about it is it because it's so gradual, it left such a meticulous record of how these steps occurred, either in the fossil record, uh, or in like modern organisms. So we have functionally like every step we need to explain this process, basically. So, um. So how do we go from like a multicellular organ? Are we starting with like eukaryotes, so organisms with nucleus in their cells? Or are we starting with like prokaryotes? I the, guess the, like I guess, bacteria and archaea. Yeah, I guess like prokaryotes, like the real like as er as early as we can go. I guess. Okay, because I'm not a I. Sorry, I really can't tell you about like um uh biogenesis. And much yeah. about the last Universal Common Ancestor, because I'm not an organic chem person. I took, I've taken a few chemistry classes, hated all of them. So, <laughs> well, I've read like a book on biogenesis. Not if you, <laughs> if if you would uh, feel better starting with with the the eukaryotes with a nucleus, that's fine. Just whatever, well, whatever you want to go with. So once we get to Luca, the last Universal Common Ancestor. So this is some population probably of prokaryotes who are able to exchange segments of DNA between themselves. Right. Once you get to that point, you have a split. Yeah, and you know, I think the name Luca might be a little bit misleading. It was for me because um, it, it makes it sound like it's one animal, you know, but it's actually a population, right? Right, right. and that's true uh, also when you're dealing with uh, more complex organisms too, like... Um, so you're dealing with like a population was the last common ancestor instead of like single individual. Although you can look at it either way. You can say that this was the population from which two species spread uh, or you know descended from. But also there was an individual who gave birth, you know, to two offspring, one of whom would become the the ancestor of like possums and the other who would become the ancestor of like humans. You know, so mm -hmm. another way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All very whack. Yeah. Um. Been trying to find a slide, a particular slide. Okay. Well. So have this split, and I'm trying to find a particular slide that has a phylogeny on it. Are you works, trying Eric. to sh uh, share your screen? Because I might, I don't know if I have to add that or, or how that works on. Oh, I was going to share. Okay. Yeah, well, does it let me? It should. I don't know if it'll let me. Yeah, if the button by like the webcam. Yeah, now I can see it. I think it's loading. There we go. So you can see it? Yep. I made it, I okay. made it big. Fantastic. So um, here is a of broad strokes phylogeny of the different domains so at the very bottom here we have bacteria so from luca tree splits you have on the one hand the lineage leading to bacteria our most distant common or our most distant um cousins share the 
most ancient common ancestor. And then the other branch leads to what's called archaea. Now, really the difference between like <laughs> bacteria and archaea is like, for one thing, both of them um, independently invented DNA genomes. It appears that Luca was an RNA genome uh, organism. And then they each independently in you or switched to using DNA for their genome. Which is kind of interesting because they have different uh, replication um, enzymes. So we have archaean uh, DNA replication enzymes, which is kind of neat. <clears throat> so um, you have these different groups. So archaea is actually a grade. It's not a clade anymore. There are clades of archaea, like Uri archaeota, which is right there uh-huh. above bacteria. That's most of the more familiar archaeans. So a lot of archaeans are these, um, th- they're called extremophiles. Mm-hmm. They live in places like that are either very, very cold or under super intense pressure or very hot, like the, uh, um, you know, like the Yellowstone uh, thermal geysers or and all that sort of stuff. Volcanoes, right? Or volcanoes, yeah. Cool. And all I these think, places that are like, I think some of them can even like survive the vacuum of space, like cling to comets. Wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I mean that might be how some uh, of them got here. Uh, possibly. Okay. I'm not a big fan of panspermia, but it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, not not seeding life. Just say, you know, saying it's possible that maybe life was already here and one of them hitched a ride. You know, just a you know, uh, I think it's a, a neat idea. <laughs> Like I said it is possible um i don't really put a lot of weight on it but it, it's possible yeah um it's highly so, unlikely but yeah it if you look well when you look out into space you see lots of organic molecules i mean like organic molecules are all over the place i don't really see life forming and that what that seems to indicate is that forming organic molecules is easy living organic molecules is relatively difficult and I, you know, I'm not at all surprised by that. Um, so, well, because really, the basis of evolution is, like, replication with a certain level of fidelity, right? You're passing on some genetic material from generation to, to generation, and it's accruing variations over the generations, and then you have natural selection acting on those variations, leading to adaptations. All right, that's really the the core of evolution. What did you mean by fi- so, fidelity when you how were you using that uh, in that? So it copies itself, no, not perfectly. Uh-huh. It copies pretty well, not perfectly. And the reason is if it copies itself perfectly, well, it can't uh, respond to the uh, the environment should the environment change. And if it does, if it replicates too poorly there are too many errors then uh, you'll disrupt your proteins and you'll just screw everything up so you have to have a deg- um if it replicated perfectly that would just be a clone right that'd be a perfect clone and we don't even see that with bacteria right they have a very high degree of, like being fidelity but it's not perfect they're not perfect clones of each other they all of them have very minuscule um differences between them so like in a living organism like when it reproduces i guess so it has a nucleotide sequence and it, the dna mm-hmm. is attempting to replicate itself perfectly that's what it, i guess is trying to do but it has errors and those are what's called mutations is that correct because that's my understanding oh it's not trying to replicate perfectly right there is probably a sweet spot between repli- between replicating perfectly and destroying yourself by having too many errors that sweet spot is where organisms have basically um gotten to there are different mutation rates for different organisms but yes those errors are the are mutations that is the substrate on which natural selection acts because all of us are born with these mutations mostly point mutations but also inversions uh, duplications and transpositions, things like that. And these, if and they confer uh, different phenotypes, 
And so those phenotypes are either uh, harmful or neutral or beneficial. And if they're harmful, they're bad. You know, you probably get wiped out of the gene pool. Or if they're neutral, they don't do anything at all, really. But then if they're beneficial, for whatever reason, then they persist and they come to predominate, typically. Right? Yeah. Like, there's, um, um, there's people in the Himalayas who have a beneficial mutation that allows them to live at such a high altitude where most people wouldn't. I, I was reading about uh, that. that. Yeah, that sort of independently happened a bunch of times in humans in these these um, high mountain populations. Is there a selection for certain genes that facilitate them living at such high altitudes? Also, a uh, there was a really interesting study on these humans called the um, so I think it was the Bajau. The Bajau. I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce it, but basically their spleen is larger. It is statistically significantly larger other people and the reason is they hunt by diving so they hold their breath for long periods of time and over time this has caused over generations this has caused their spleen to get larger because it is an extra reservoir of like oxygenated uh, red blood cells mm -hmm. and so they so there's this pressure for them to have more of these so that they can dive longer because that's their niche were right so um so to get back to our i guess my main question so we were starting with luca um i guess what yes what would be sort of the next step um if we're trying to move towards a more modern organism so one of the main differences between well uh, you basically have a cell that has you have a few different um, like types of proteins, such as ATP synthase, and uh, you have ribosomes, and you have proteins, and you have DNA and RNA, and you have a, a cell membrane uh, or a cell wall. So from there, you have a split. That we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so then you have a split. Now the, the main one of the main differences between bacteria and archaea, aside from the the DNA replication proteins, is they have their um their cell wall has the what is it the same um type of molecule in it, but it's like different. It's it's flipped basically for these guys. And so one of them for like the archaeans it's one way. And for bacteria, it's the other way. And there are a few other like minor differences, but both of these are prokaryotes. So they're they don't have they don't have a cell nucleus like we do. Their DNA is in what's called a nucleoid. It's right. basically all just clustered together. They have ribosomes and proteins and things like that. No organelles. There are no I say there are no membrane-bound organelles at this point, but there are both bacteria and archaea that have been discovered that have, like, essentially membrane-bound spaces, so it's kind of... it's iffy. But so so they there's, don't have... there's no Golgi apparatus? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, there's no Golgi apparatus, okay. no um, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, uh, no mitochondria, because the mitochondria is itself a bacterium. I'm, I'm recalling my, uh, my middle school biology... <laughs> right so um so yeah the, the golgi yeah the golgi apparatus is basically a uh, part of the end of like gene uh transcription and translation you uh you have your your enzymes which look at a uh, a sequence of dna they transcribe it into an rna sequence and that rna sequence gets translated into an amino acid sequence and then it gets uh, goes to the Golgi apparatus, and basically gets folded and packaged and sent off to wherever it's supposed to go. Um, so from from here we have our split. You got bacteria on the one side, and then archaeans on the other. And archaea is a grade. So a grade means that this is not a single clade. It is not all members 
don't share one single common ancestor. They share different common ancestors because Eukarya, which is us, the organisms with a cell nucleus nest within Archaea. And you can see Eukarya is at the very top. So eukaryotes arose, it, it seems most likely, from an Archaean that engulfed a, a bacterium and that bacterium became the mitochondria. Right. So now the reason this was been a oh so the right. the way that um, some of these uh, microscopic organisms actually gained some of these organelles was they actually absorbed uh, another organism that had them. Isn't that uh, is that what you're saying? No. So the only thing that we got was the mitochondrion. Okay. The other all the organelles came afterwards. Um. So, eukaryotes have genomes that are much larger than archaeans and bacteria. And the reason is, what does the mitochondria do? It's the... Powerhouse of the cell. Right. You know what, what that means. Well, it, it um, provides uh, energy. Right, exactly. It provides cellular energy. That cellular energy <clears throat> is a molecule called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. So you make ATP, or you can make ATP in small amounts through what's called a substrate level phosphorylation. So basically, when you break down, do glycolysis, the breakdown of glucose, um, you break it down first into a pyruvate or pyruvic acid that occurs in your cytoplasm, and that generates a little bit of ATP. You also get a little bit of ATP. No, wait, do you do you get ATP from? Anyway, point is, um, you get a little bit of ATP from that process, and then when you, and then inside your mitochondria, you get the most of your ATP from uh, from uh, the process of oxidative phosphorylation. So basically, if you think of cellular respiration in three steps, you have glycolysis, so glucose to pyruvate, and then you have um, the citric acid cycle or the, the Krebs cycle is the other name for it. And so what the Krebs cycle does is it basically produces these uh, electron uh, 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 transporters or receptors. I'm trying to think of the correct way. Uh, let's see. Hold on. I'm trying to think of the correct way, too. Um, yeah, they're cofactors. Uh, electron carriers? Da, 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 da. Electron carriers. There we go. That's the correct word. I Googled they're it. Electron carriers. <laughs> well, that's, that's yeah, your electron carriers. And so they are electrons to the electron transport chain, which is on the inner mitochondrial membrane. And from there, you are generating the, you're using that to uh, create a, uh, a, a large differential so that you can pump protons uh, with your ATP synthase. So the ATP synthase, its job is, it's an enzyme, and its job is to generate ATP by, com by combining inorganic phosphate with ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, and that creates ATP. So most of that, most of ATP's generation happens in the mitochondria. So the bacterium that became mitochondria, that um, association, which was called endosymbiosis, between the archaean and the bacterium, that allowed for eukaryotes to form organelles to a much greater extent than anything we see in archaea and bacteria. It also allowed them to get much larger uh, genomes. And so with that, you can have... Uh, you know, you can form, like, multicellular organisms and... Uh, larger bodies and all this sort of stuff because even the the prokaryotes which are considered like multicellular um they're they're still very very small right they're not forming big bodies like anything we see in eukaryotes so so you have this association this endosymbiosis uh between an archaean and a bacterium and that the descendants of that become uh, eukaryotes so what's interesting is that 
Ar is that uh, mitochondria still divide like bacteria. To this day, they still do. Um, whereas our, our the larger cell undergoes like mitosis. You guys remember that whole process where it, uh, you know, your chromosomes line up along the metaphase plate in the middle and they get pulled to the poles, all that fun stuff. Yeah, there's like mitosis the, and the then another process like meiosis or something like that. Yeah, yeah, meiosis or meiosis, however you pronounce it, is yeah. is a um, that's important for sexual reproduction. So the that comes into play because you have recombination and um, uh, every combination in uh, prokaryotes because they can take in DNA from their environment and then incorporate it into their own DNA and whatnot. But yeah, meiosis is the process by which, by which you have a sex um, a stem, your, your you know, gamete stem cell, and it divides uh, twice. And in the first part of that, the first division of meiosis one, you have uh, what's called crossing over. So you can basically swap segments of chromosomes uh, between each other. And this is in part how you generate um, genetic variation. Don't think I have a slide. So that's, I did another PowerPoint on like the process of evolution. And that's where I talk about that more there. But well, well I, I think I, my next question, because oh, will be something a lot more like more focused on when it comes to evolution, like talk, probably talking about wolves and dogs. But I mean, once you get to eukaryotes, I mean, we're considered to be eukaryotes, right? Yeah. So, yeah, we are eukaryotes. An older tree of eukaryotes. So once you get, can you, can you see my mouse? Yes. Okay, so we're here at this point. So eukaryotes, you have this endosymbiotic event. And then, like I said, this is an old tree. <laughs> but um, basically, you have two big splits. Uh, you have one split between like plants and algae uh, and most unicellular organisms. It's all on this side, uh, SAR. Uh, and Archeoplastida and uh, Haptista. This, these guys are like, so plants are in this group, the Archeoplastida, Rhodophyta is the red algae, Chloroplastida is the uh, green algae. We don't really talk about the Glaucophytes, nobody cares about them. <laughs> uh, Haptophytes are the Coccoliths, which are these little shelly guys. Mm. Um, and then you have like Forams, Diatoms, Kelp, all that sort of stuff down here in the SAR group. On the other side of that, also you can kind of ignore most of these guys. <laughs> <laughs> we either don't know a whole lot about them or they're really weird. So I don't think I've ever seen anyone really cares to ask about like metamonads, you know, no one really cares about those guys. <laughs> um, no love for the ridgy fillids. Sorry, guys. So the other split leads to amorphia. Amorphia is our other big group. So we have, and again, you have a split between in that group. So it splits two ways. You have, Amoebozoa, on one side. So those are your true amoebas. There are lots of amoeboid um, eukaryotes. But your true amoebas, like our lovely brain-eating amoeba, Oof. and amoeba proteus, all those guys, that's in this group, amoebozoa. So they're more closely related to us than they are to ants and other things. The other split, again, no one really cares about a piece of monads or breviata. In fact, I think breviata falls under amoebozoa nowadays. Not sure. Like I said, this is an old tree. Um, the other important clade is Opisthoconta. This is us. This is fungi, plus animals, plus a couple other like little weird groups that, again, no one really cares about. <laughs> so much of protist uh, diversity is people are just like, I don't care. You know, they're not animals. They're not that cool or plants. Yeah. So, um, one of, so one of the interesting things about this clade, Amorphia, the reason we know amoeba, amoebas nest with us, is there is a triple gene fusion for the biosynthesis of pyrimidines, which are one of the two types of DNA uh, nucleotides. You have purines and pyrimidines. So there's a triple gene fusion uh, 
for the genes involved in pyrimidine biosynthesis. And that's true of us, that's true of the apusomonads, and amoebas. Now, you have to kind of pause for a moment and wonder, if we're not related, if humans and elephants and, you know, uh, amoebas are not related to each other, why do we all have this one triple gene fusion? Why? It's not like it's needed for all eukaryotic organisms to live. Clearly, none of these other guys have it. So, so why just these guys? Um, amoeba are still considered eukaryotes? Correct. So all okay. these guys are eukaryotes. They all have a nucleus in their cells. Well, <laughs> they, they yes, they, they all have a nucleus in their cells and... Um, all have mitochondria now some of them have or well almost all of them have mitochondria um a few of them have like adapted their mitochondria and a few lineages have just lost it completely but the vast vast majority of eukaryotes have mitochondria so those are their, their like two main nucleus and mitochondria so um, um i have a question um hmm? would it be accurate to say that when you're looking at eukaryotes just as a classification, um, could you say that different like animals and, and compared to humans or even multicellular like microscopic or organisms, um, the only difference between them is that they have more or less of these cells because the cells are the same. They have a nucleus and that some of those cells have special specialized functions like if in organs. Like, so you're asking, is the difference between us and other multicellular organisms is is what the? I guess just that um types of that, specialized cells we have. Yeah, like if you're, I guess it'd be simpler to compare, like you know, like an amoeba to like you know, uh, an animal. Is that the animal okay. has a lot more cells, and those cells are specialized to do certain things, um, like in tissue and organs. I mean, does that? Uh, make sense, or am I way off? I mean, in a broad sense, sure. Like, all of these guys have nucleated cells, and all the multicellular ones have cells that are like... They have, like, a division of labor in their cells, basically. I mean, sure, but... I, I wouldn't really say that that's like um it's being really general like a gotcha yeah yeah i, I yeah. wouldn't say it's like a gotcha yeah that's okay. my opinion okay um, um well because I... when you get to like animals for instance there's like a very wide diversity in the number and types of cells that mm -hmm. animals have so like you, know, you look at sponges and they don't like have tissues and you look at placozoans and they're also really really simple and then you are going up in kind of complexity from like you know tenophores and cnidarians on up so yeah and when you say simple you mean it's simple relative to more complex organisms like humans or elephants or whatever like you're comp you, that's when you yeah because this is something that I, I i get so annoyed when i see kent hoven talk about this how he says oh there's no there's no such thing as a simple uh unicellular organism or it's not simple because even this small this one cell is so complex but it's like <laughs> we're talking about relative simplicity like it's simple compared to or uh, animals that are so complex because like you said they have all these other specialized uh cells and they do all these different things yeah uh, kind of my problem with with that is on some scale Everything is going to look complex. Right. It doesn't matter what it is. If if you like, if we were to shrink down to the molecular scale and watch like a really basic reaction, like um, I don't know, freaking like uh, hydrochloric acid and like sodium hydroxide or something like that. Like this is a really simple reaction between two non-living compounds. If you watch that on the molecular level you'd be like oh it's so fast it's so complicated but like it's really not though it's two really simple <laughs> molecules interacting with each other to produce this yeah. um and the same is kind of true of like 
Uh, um, do I have a picture of it? Not really. Um, okay, I guess I'll show you this one. So, see this green enzyme, AT ATPase? Yeah. So, one of the problems that I, I notice with, like, creationists and stuff is they will pull up these diagrams, diagrammatic illustrations of some enzyme, and they'll say, look at how complicated that thing is. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's cool and all, and sure, there's some measure of complexity to it, certainly, but this is a diagram. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the actual thing looks a lot more, like, chaotic, and it doesn't... When you watch, like, the videos of, like, how ATP synthase works, where you have, like, your little inorganic phosphate, and you have your ADP, and they come together, and it turns, you know, one notch and all that. It's like, yeah, it's cool and all, but it's not quite how it works that is again a diagrammatic representation it does this but it's not perfect it's like spinning one way and then sometimes it spins the opposite direction and then sometimes you know it doesn't quite work and th there's a lot more complexity to these things because they are molecules right and they're biological molecules so it's not going to be perfect it's going to be pretty darn good at its job in most cases but it's not going to be perfect and to just show these diagrammatic representations as, oh, look at how complex it is, is just fundamentally dishonest. Yeah. Um, like I said, at any level, at some level, anything is going to look complex, no matter how simple it is. So there's nothing really you can do about that. Um, the, yeah. the point is, point is really, can it evolve? The answer is, yeah. Uh, ATP synthase is a subset of ATP aces it was not the original. It, it is a subset of these other ATP aces. Um, in fact, the ATP synthase is itself um, a couple of enzymes that have been um, hijacked for a new function or co opted, would probably be a nicer way to put it. So the base of the ATP synthase, that little base that's embedded in the membrane, is a helicase enzyme. So it was used for unzipping DNA. Like those molecular and that machines. Got co -opted. Exactly, yeah. It's one of those little enzymatic molecular machines. Um, and this helicase got co-opted, embedded in the membrane. And you add these other parts on top of it. So this is, and again, that's like not, that's non-controversial really among biologists. If you read the different papers on the evolution of ATP synthase and the ATP aces, you'll see that. It's it's pretty pretty definitely a, a helicase that was co-opted for a new function. And that's true of very many things. Biology er, and evolution is all about co-opting things. It's about taking what you already have yes. and using it for a new function. It's not about wholesale inventing stuff. And that's another major creationist claim is is when they say like where did arms come from well we had fins we just co-opted the genes for fins into arms yeah <laughs> right I, I talked about this in one uh, a video i did where creationist was asking they were talking about um a turtle that uh, you know there there are those i think uh, tortoises that have the they have like the opening or like the the sort of hole in the, their shell so they can because their necks grew longer so they could reach um vegetation and i think it was like kent hoven he was asking like well, why didn't the turtle grow wings and it's like well um because it already had the neck so it's easier for it to just grow a longer neck rather than build an entirely new structure that yes. it would need to grow wings so you're just using what it already has yeah, there's a, there's a concept in evolutionary biology um, uh, which was first kind of put forth by um, um, uh, not Fisher um, I think it was Haldane uh, JBS Haldane and it's the, the fitness landscape Ever heard of that? I don't think so So if you imagine that there is like a, a sort of like a geographic map with like mountains and plateaus and hills and stuff like that Imagine that that is evolutionary fitness. So you have a hill, and the, 
the the best way to go up a hill, for instance, is to go up like a gentle slope, right? It'd be yeah. really hard to jump all the way from like ground level to the top of this hill <laughs> right <laughs> in a single bound. That's gonna be really difficult. Unless you're the Hulk. Yeah, unless you're the Hulk, yeah. Um you've got other genetic problems to worry about then. True. Um true. Uh and, and Richard Dawkins made great use of this analogy in his book, Climbing Mount Improbable, which I highly recommend. Very good book. Um, all of his books are very good. So, um, so you go up this hill, you, you, know, you walk up the gentle slope. You don't jump all the way to the top in one go. And, and so likewise, um, in evolution, you have to make these small changes gradually. Now, that's not to say large changes can't happen. They they do happen every so often. Um, but the odds of screwing something up via jumping these long hurdles, you're you're way more likely to screw stuff up rather than if you do small tinkerings. True. And Ronald Fisher worked that out mathematically back in like the 1930s, which is basically what led to neo-Darwinism. Haldane, Fisher, and uh, Wright all working well, not together, working separately, really, doing, basically figuring out how um, natural selection acts on Mendelian traits and how long it would take for these traits to become fixed in the population and how much of a selective pressure you need, etc. Um, that was their their thing back in the in the thirties, twenties, and thirties, really, which so, led to neo Darwinism. So, um, I think if I if I make a video with this, I'm going to title it "Jackson Wheat Teaches Me Middle School Biology." So I, let me hit you with a, a similar question because we were talking about sort of energy in the cells and stuff. Can you explain mm -hmm. to me why if you have frog legs that you're freshly peeled and you pour salt on them that they start twitching? Can you explain that to me? Oh, that's like, um, oh, uh, oh my goodness. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. But that's, it's like you're, uh, uh, you have like sodium um, in your your nerves, right? Right. So if you um, if you pour uh, like salt or soy sauce or something, like, you've probably seen the video with like the octopus, and, like they pour soy sauce on it and it starts like moving. Yeah. Uh, well, that's it, that's because the uh, I believe the sodium is like interacting with their nerves or whatever, and that's causing them to move. They're you know they're long dead. So. Yeah, I just think that that's really cool because I, I think it's creepy. <laughs> yeah, the chemical reaction that our bodies do, um, I think, involves some of those chemicals. Um, so just introducing them after the fact is going to cause something to happen with those muscles. Um, but so I, I had a debate yesterday. It was me and Snake was right versus John Maddox and oh, Bubblegum Gun, if you're familiar with him. I don't know who who yeah. that is. I know who who Maddox is. Yeah, um, and it was it was about it went about how you would expect, um, but it was fun. And one of the questions that Maddox's partner kept bringing up over and over again was he was demanding that we give him the intermediate between an ancient wolf and a Dalmatian. Um. It's sorry. It wasn't the nerves. It was the muscles. Right. Or right. The, the soy sauce is causing the the. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Keep going. Well, no. I was just so I was just wondering, like, because. Um. Give you a a transitional form between like a wolf and a yes, like a Dalmatian. Yeah. Well, we have wolf dogs in the fossil record. They're like fully frozen. Right. Um. I I mean like and we. Uh, we they the paleontologists have like genetically uh, tested these guys and shown that these are more closely related to modern dogs than to wolves, but they're not quite modern dogs. They're still they're still um like pre the last common ancestor of all modern dogs. But yeah, those they're in the fossil record. We have paleogenomic samples from them. That's not such a weird hill to die on. I I know, and this guy doesn't think that wolves and dogs are related. I asked him that. And he said, absolutely not, was his answer. But that's, that that's the answer so you said is, weird. I know, it was, it was such a weird debate. But 
the, the answer that you said is basically what Snake told him is that we have fossil dogs or fossil wolf dogs. Yeah. And I asked him directly, I said, would you need the fossil of this intermediate? Of course, you know, we're talking about populations here, but obviously, like, mm. he doesn't care we're about bit. that. Um, would you need the fossil of this intermediate presented in front of you for it to count as evidence? And he said yes, basically. And and then later on, he asked me, like, so, well, do you have do you have the fossil of this intermediate? And I said, I don't personally have the skeleton of that intermediate wolf dog. No. But and then he was like, well, isn't it convenient that, you know, you when I ask, you can't present the fossil. I'm like, well, go to a museum. And he says, oh, they don't have the fossils there. It was very similar to I just you did a video. <laughs> I just did a video on the the you know the Wendy Wright and Richard Dawkins video. Oh it, God! Yeah, and it was very similar yeah. to that. He, um, yeah, the yeah that that is that's right. I remember that she was infuriating to listen to. Like, it, show me the evidence. All right, well let's go down to the museum. Oh, that, no, there, there's not evidence there. What? <laughs> yeah. That's what I was saying in my video. I was saying, because she was like, oh, well, <clears throat> where's the museums don't have the actual fossil of this human ancestor. And I was saying, if you go to the National Museum of Ethiopia, they that's where they have the real Lucy skeleton. They have it there. I mean, I, on display would obviously be a replica. But, you know, I, if if they took the her, if they took her in the back, which she doesn't deserve, um, you know, because that's like the opportunity of a lifetime. You know, right. would she then accept it? I don't think so. You know. Well, sure, right. She has a a um, theological uh like um, condition blinders. or whatever. She's uh, got blinders on. Yeah, she's never going to accept any evidence presented because she can't. She won't. Not doesn't fall under her um purview. Um. Oh, shall I? Shall we? Um on with the uh yes please yeah. what's the next uh step yeah um okay so as of the common ancestor of all carrots lived about two billion years ago this is right after an event known as the great uh, oxygenation event oh so, here we go or oxidation either way whatever you want to call it there's like lots of different names for it i thought you, you were gonna say like, the great dying <laughs> uh I mean, this probably did kill a lot of organisms. True. So, uh, most um, prokaryotes were probably uh, like anaerobic at this time, so they're like, "Why is there oxygen everywhere?" No. Um, so you have uh, uh, so very low levels of oxygen prior to about yeah two point one or so million years ago, or billion years ago. Sorry, two point one billion years ago. And then you have what is probably the like evolutionary origin of cyanobacteria uh, and oxygenic photosynthesis. And so then they start putting out huge amounts of oxygen. And this, as you can see, it greatly increases the amount of oxygen present, although not to present day levels. And then uh, you kind of tapers off again for a while until really right before the Cambrian explosion. <laughs> so... Uh, it's really mostly like surface waters are being oxygenated. So the surface of the oceans are oxygenated, but the deep ocean is not really oxygenated. That doesn't occur until like the Paleozoic or the Phanerozoic, I guess, in total. So we're about here. So this is about when, yeah, you see the oldest eukaryotes. <clears throat> and from there, we can kind of scroll forward a little bit. So... Acrotarchs, so these are eukaryotic, well, some of these are eukaryotic organisms. So we start seeing these guys about 1.8 billion years ago, or 1.7 billion years ago, there you go. Um, so we see our first fossils of, of eukaryotes about 1.7 billion years ago, so shortly after molecular clocks indicate that the, um, that, that the ancestor of eukaryotes originated. And then about... 720 million years ago so you really just have these microscopic eukaryotes for about a billion years so from about 1.7 to you know about 700 so from 1.7 billion years ago to 700 million years ago approximately you really just have these microscopic eukaryotes that's that's all you got for a long time 
And part of the reason is, again, there's not a whole lot of oxygen in the environment. So the reason that that oxygen is important for um, the for the the sizes that organisms can can reach is oxygen places a limit. So the most efficient way to convert um, uh, biomass into energy is cellular respiration, is oxygenic uh, or aerobic re uh, respiration. And so that's what we're talking about with the mitochondria. So that's what the mitochondria does. And if there's not a lot of oxygen in the environment, you can't make a lot of ATP, and so you can't get very big. But we do start... But oxygen levels are now higher than they used to be, and so we do start seeing the first um, macroscopic organisms. Uh, well, you see a few like very small macroscopic organisms uh, a bit earlier, but now you start seeing communities of macroscopic organisms about 635 million years ago. You also have this whole period that's called the cryogenian. So you have the like total glaciation of the Earth, basically. Or so that's what the Earth looked like? Or that's a rep uh, an, an estimation? Yeah, that is a... Wow. Maybe the, the equator might have been um, visible. Mm -hmm. Other than that, yeah, it was pretty much frozen over. <laughs> wow, I've never seen that before. That's really cool. The snowball. Yeah, that's that's cool. Yeah, that's the snowball Earth. So that was so it happened a couple of times between about seven hundred and twenty and six hundred and thirty-five million years ago. That's why it's called the cryogenian cry, cry, mm. cold cryogenics. Um, yeah. So you basically you had uh, Rodinia. So Rodinia it was this was the supercontinent that was present at the time, and it was basically all in equatorial regions. That means that it was getting weathered a lot. And so the weathering of rocks sucks carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and so this is pulling lots of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, mm. and since that's being pulled out, it's getting a lot cooler, and there's this feedback loop, and it's got colder and colder. So um, animals... And, and this is before Pangaea, right? Mm -hmm. This supercontinent? Uh, this okay. is yeah, we're way before Pangaea. Yeah, and and so because CO two was being removed from the atmosphere, that would have been warming the the Earth. So the opposite effect is happening since we we it was losing CO two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It was losing okay. CO two, so it was cooling, and now we we're pumping lots of CO two into the atmosphere, so we're warming. Yeah. So what? So what? What again was causing the CO two to get sucked out of the atmosphere? The uh... that's the the process of weathering of rocks. Okay. Causes CO2 to be sucked out of the atmosphere. So that's what, uh, so like, um, you know, the erosion of, or the formation of like, um, you know, the Himalayas, for instance, sucked a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere because you're getting these pushed up and there's erosion happening. And so it's like, it's just sucking all this carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere as a result of the, the process of weathering the chemical aspects of it. So that's like it's erosion a, of the rocks, erosion of the, the mountain? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So as erosion happens, then this is causing CO2 to be sucked out of the atmosphere. And so because all the land mass at this time is basically at equatorial regions where weathering is the greatest, it's causing very large amounts of CO2 to be sucked out of the atmosphere. But why, why does the weathering of the rocks cause that? I don't remember the exact geochemical reason for that okay um but that's the the takeaway is basically okay this process causes this effect oh you could probably ask like uh stephen bauman or or uh mr wilford and they probably yeah. have the exact like geochemical reason that happens sure um that'll be my homework for later there you go exactly oh so this happens a couple of times and then finally, Rodinia moves essentially out of equatorial. The majority of it moves out of equatorial regions by about 635 million years ago, and we don't get major freezing events anymore. So then the Ediacaran, which is the period right before the Cambrian, we start seeing these, you know, these macroscopic communities. So you metazoans are everything more complex than like a sponge. Okay. So the earliest evidence of sponges goes back to like I think it's 650 million years ago. It's these molecules called steranes. So you have these steranes in these rocks from Oman in Africa. And 
are consistent with sponges. So that's the earliest evidence of sponges, about 650 million years ago, so during the cryogenian. And the Ediacaran is, so right after we get the earliest evidence of sponges, we start seeing the, this diversity of eumetazoans. So these guys down here in this bottom picture, these are all you know, different organisms. We have like Kimberella, this little guy down here on the bottom left, and then Dickinsonia down here on the bottom right, and then this is Charnia. And so these are all different animals. So Kimberella is like a stem mollusk or a stem spiralian, so it's related to the clade that includes mollusks and brachiopods and rotifers, all those guys. Dickinsonia. So Dickinsonia is even more... Actually, I think I have a better picture of it. Let me scroll on down. Da -da 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 -da. Yes, I do. Okay. So yeah, we start seeing all these guys, basically, in the Ediacaran. You see Tribrachidium, which is like a stem eumetazoan. Then you see Dickinsonia, which is a stem bilaterian. Then Icaria, which is uh, also a bilaterian. And then you have Kimberella, which is a Lophotrochozoan or a Spiralian, whichever one you want to use. So <clears throat> that just means... So protostome means that it uh it forms its anus before it's sorry it forms its mouth before it's anus embryonically proto stome means first mouth and we're we are de we're, we're deuterostomes right exactly right we form our our mouth second the anus forms first so, so um that, yeah i think r and ra had a joke about this that, um he was talking about ken hoven and he was like there was a, a point in time in your development that you were literally just an asshole <laughs> yeah, every zoology professor makes this joke. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, how could you resist? I mean, it is pretty funny. Yeah, it's it's a fair point. Um, yeah, your um, is it your archenteron becomes your your uh, anus for because we, uterostomes. We, we start out as a single cell, and then the very first sort of development is that one side of that opens, and. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in deuterostomes, it's the, the back end first and that, and they they connect and that's basically our intestinal tract or it's what's True. going yeah, to your become whole digestive tract. Yeah. It's going to be your digestive tract. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, so yeah, you become, so yeah, you're, you're one little cell and then you do a couple of divisions and you become a little solid ball and that's called a morula. Then become a hollow as you keep dividing you become a hollow like fluid filled um ball of cells and that's called the blastula then the next development the next major development is um yeah you open up one side uh, and so you have one opening uh and a little pocket inside and that's you're called the gastrula because this is the formation of your your digestive tract um and so yeah, for us, for deuterostomes, that's your anus. For protostomes, that's your mouth. And then the other side connects, and then, you know, you're off to the races. And then things just keep on kind of going. Um, what so, about, um, is, that, is there a term like that, like a blastopore? Like, is that what we're called when we're a clump of cells like that? Or was it something so else? So your blastopore is the opening. Okay, okay. Uh, the, the, you're called, you are the, blast, the blastula. Okay. And you're the whole two... That is, is the sorry. Got it. Blastula is when you're a little hollow ball of cells. Um, no, yeah, I think it is your your blastoporia is the hole, if I remember correctly. Yeah, um, I I remember one time I I was, you know, I have so many stories about me talking to Kent Oven, but I've got a million of them. But I was I was actually on the phone with him, and was I was the opening. Yeah, yeah, we were talking about. Um, because he doesn't believe the idea that a single-celled organism could evolve into a multicellular one. And I said, but Kent, you were a single cell in your mother's womb, and you divided and became the multicellular organism that you are today. And don't you think that there's a con – that can't you see that there would be a connection between that and between the process that happened over – a long time period, which is sort of, I guess, like Evo Devo, you know, com comparing mm -hmm. the em growth of an embryo to the growth of us as a species or our evolution. And he was like, no, no, there's no connection. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you do have to be kind of careful with that comparison. Um, but yeah, yeah, certainly there there are um, 
you know, developmental connections between with with that and our evolutionary history. That was actually a joke. I think that I think it was JBS Haldane made because he had he was like giving a speech and some um, woman in the crowd was like, "Expect me to believe we came from a single celled organism?" And he said, "Ah, but ma'am, you did it yourself in nine months." Yeah. Yeah. I, I do like that. I mean, I think speaking generally, I think it's okay. Um, like, it's, an, oh. it's it might not be completely accurate, but it is good for that type of comparison because, you know, they can't deny that, you know, and they know that that's true. Yeah, I mean, I think their response to that would probably be like, yes, but we have the genetic code to transform ourselves from that single cell to... The multicellular organism we yeah. have we've streamlined that process basically that's whereas, like exactly what he said <laughs> right that would be yeah that'd be my res- my response to that too but um but yeah we so in this early period though we have cool thing about evolutionary history is you have this connection between stratigraphy and phylogenetics you see the first life for the first eukaryotes, right? The first life was like 3.7 billion years ago. First eukaryotes about 2 billion years ago. Were then you we there? See... Exactly. Yes, I was there. Okay. Can't prove I wasn't. Um, That's true. And then the very first uh, animals about 650 million years ago. Simple ones like sponges. And then we see a diversification of animals in the period shortly after that. So this follows, so this, there is an evolutionary pattern that we expect, a phylogenetic pattern and a stratigraphic pattern, and they connect. They, they reinforce each other. All these guys show up before the Cambrian. So, and Stephen Meyer, there you go. There's your, your predecessors. <laughs> are, are these guys eukaryotes still? Or Yes. Okay. Yeah, all these are eukaryotes, because we are also eukaryotes, and their ancestors were eukaryotes also. Gotcha. So we're moving right along. Yeah, so we are in animals now. So wow. Tribrachidium is like a an early animal, and then Dickinsonia is an early bilaterian, and then Ikari is an early protostome, uh, and then you have... So you just kind of keep... And then Kimberell is like an early uh, Lophotrochozoan. So yeah, we're just kind of chugging along here. Um, um, so yeah, so at this point... You look at something like Dickinsonia or Ikaria, what probably the common ancestor, it's probably look more like Ikaria, the last common ancestor of like bilaterians look like. So, do you think you could full screen so your this, slides? It might make it a little uh, easier to see. Yeah, yeah, let me do that. Sorry. Yeah. Just because the text is a little bit small. Yeah, that is. Um, there you go. Try to hide the little thing at the bottom. Yeah, that's weird. I don't think it. I don't think it changed anything. That's weird. Oh, oh. interesting. Well, um, well, it doesn't matter. So these are our Cambrian ancestors in a sense, except except Kimberella. I mean, none of these are probably our direct ancestors, but mm-hmm. Icaria is probably what the common ancestor of all Deuterosto or sorry of all Bilaterians look like. Probably what our common ancestor look like. Thing. Very, very simple and segmented. Is that what bilaterian um, means? Bilaterian means you are bilaterally symmetric. If you cut the body in half in one way, then it is approximately symmetrical on both sides. Okay, because that's one thing that I have I have to tell to creationists a lot, because whenever I go into the side chat of a creationist like live stream, I get swarmed mm-hmm. with questions from these people. They all want to know about Lucy. They all want to ask me a million things. Um, and one of the yeah. things I was talking about yesterday was somebody asked me about Lucy and saying like that they found like baboon remains in Lucy's skeleton. And I was like, oh, no, it's a um, no, no, no. I know what that's from. That's okay. from a one of the papers um, compared one of her vertebrae uh, against other primates and said, um, like a vertebrae looks kind of like that of okay. a baboon, uh, but no, they didn't actually find baboon um, f- fossils mixed in. And some creationists keep 
have misrepresented that one just all sorts of crazy ways. They've also argued like that proves Lucy was a baboon, which she doesn't look <laughs> anything like a baboon. Yeah. Um, there, it's like they made a comparison, right? I mean, if you say that you know, we have blood just like you know, trout do, does that mean we have trout blood? Like, I don't, I don't understand. You, you know, know, it's just a comparison. They're just saying yeah. this thing is kind of like this other thing. Yeah, and Crazy. what I what I told them was that I don't I don't think that that's true. But even if it was, we have many other sp specimens of her species. So, yep. uh, but they were saying, of course, well, Lu you know, you don't have complete species, you know, uh, even though I, I listed one in the chat and, you know, you don't, you know, you don't have a, a complete enough skeleton. And what I was saying was that, first of all, we don't need a totally complete skeleton because we have Lucy's complete foot bones. We can learn a ton from that just from just from the pelvis, just from hip bones. Um, a tooth or skull cap, you can learn a lot from a small fossil. But I was telling them that if you have an incomplete rib cage, if you have a rib on one side for Lucy, we don't need the other rib because you can just mirror that because she's bilaterally yes. symmetrical. Right, exactly. If you have, right, if you like were to split her, like, you know, down the middle, top to bottom, you don't need. <laughs> Well, if you had them all on one side, if you had like all the bones on just the left half of her body, you would essentially have the whole, you know the whole skeleton, right? Yeah. <laughs> because it's going to be the same on the other side. So, yeah. I know it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, that's <clears throat> it's it's really funny how like it's just such a complete misunderstanding of how being bilaterally symmetric works. Although they're creationists, so you know it's the the bar is on the floor. Um, yeah, I don't know if you've ever had that experience where they they see that you're in a, a side chat and you get bombarded with these type of gotcha questions, you know, but. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I, I've um, Autangelo is one <laughs> who does that. He's like, yes, just, yes. Yeah, barrage you with 100 questions and they're just like utterly irrelevant to whatever thing you're talking about or, or you know, it's. Yeah, no, I've been in those situations. I was actually in one the other day arguing with a, a guy on Twitter because he had commented that, um, well, I, po I posted something about Stephen Meyer being a hack. <laughs> uh, can you tell I don't like him? You know? Yeah. And he, this dude commented and I was having a whole back and forth with him. And he eventually, like, he got to the point where he wasn't, trying to argue with the things that I was saying. He just like started yeah. listing random questions and I was like, okay, yes. I guess this is over then. Yeah, those you, I think those are copy pasted. <laughs> if you if you've gotten to the point where you're not addressing anything I say, you're just asking irrelevant questions, then you've lost, basically. That's that's it, you know. Have you Argument's seen, over. Yeah. Have you seen Steven Meyer's Newsweek article they actually published? I, I'll, I'll I think send it I to did. You. Okay. Maybe I, I think I, I have yeah. Um, I mean, you've seen his arguments anyway, even if you haven't read it, I think. But I just thought it was funny that, I mean, it was in the opinion section, but I just thought it was kind of ridiculous that they even published an article like right, that. that it's, uh, they publish uncritically this article where he's just, he's literally just speculating his own opinion and his opinion is irrelevant. No one cares. Uh, no one in the scientific community anyways. Right. So, yeah, no, it's, I, I, f I felt like, so I, I co-wrote the Stephen Meyer script with Professor Dave, the one that's on his, his channel. Cool. Um, and it felt so cathartic to get this script out. <laughs> like, because I've done a bunch of videos on the Cambrian and the Precambrian and all this. How, and like explaining all this process and how no, the Cambrian is not actually evidence for creationism. And, but like, they're all kind of disjointed. Like I'm explaining parts of it, but not the whole thing. But, but for... Dave, we did this one script which covers the whole thing. Cambrian explosion and how evolution works uh, and why all of his arguments about proteins are hilariously bad. So, yeah, we just covered the whole thing in one fell swoop and it felt really cathartic to get that out there. So, Oh, man. Yeah, I, I did a debate. I've done two debates recently and uh, the one I told you about yesterday and then before that it was me and Mark Reed versus Sal Cordova and then Eric Jewell. 
Uh, and yeah, I know who Sal yeah, is. Pro- I don't know who Eric is. The proteins came up a lot. I don't know if you remember some of the people that Bill Ludlow debated back back in the day, but Bill Ludlow did a debate against that guy, Eric, ab- about um, okay. human, about you know modern humans and Homo erectus, and you know mm-hmm. he was saying, oh, you don't have one drop of DNA of these human ancestors, blah blah blah, and he was like, yes, we do. Look at the paper, and the guy was just bizarre, you know. But yeah, proteins came up a lot in Sal's questions. His questions were just ridiculous. Because yeah. Sal's favorite argument is, oh, but the proteins don't all share common ancestry. Yeah, we right. know that. That's Move what on. That's what Maddox was asking me about. Because I went into his after Nobody show. ever thought they did. Literally no one. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah. So I, it's I was, such I, a silly argument. Yeah, I was telling him, like, it doesn't matter... Because it doesn't matter about this uh, if the proteins don't link up like this. Because we know that by looking at the genetics that all living organisms have common ancestry because we can test it in the genetics. So this thing about the proteins is irrelevant. We're not using the proteins to right. argue for common ancestry. In the same way, uh, Otangelo did the same thing with um, the cell membrane. He was like... Aha, but the cell membrane for bacteria and archaea is different. Yes. Is. And? Yeah. And what do you want? <laughs> and another thing during the Maddox debate he kept bringing up was the fact that trying to debunk evolution by saying that there are differences in animals, like not just similarities showing they're related, but they're actually finding that there's a lot of differences. And I'm like... Yeah, crap, that, Sherlock. Welcome no, to an, zoology. Animals aren't direct clones of each other. Like, so a- bizarre. Yeah, that's such a bizarre argument. Like, what the? No, every every animal. I have like three different phylogenetic trees in my room uh, as posters in my room. And I'm like looking at them. Like, nope, all the animals are the same. They're all clones of each other. That's how that looks. Like, yeah, I was what. Just- I was just laughing oh. because he he considers his arguments to be very intellectual, but I counted sure at least does. at least one that was a direct rip from a Ken Hoven argument that he responded to. I was like, "You can't be serious," because oh, we... it's it's Maddox. He's just hot air. Anyway, yeah. Um, moving on. So at this point, I forgot to mention, but like, I kind of skipped like the origin of multicellularity. My bad. Um, no, it's okay. I think we can sort of skip ahead because I don't want to take up too much of your time. Okay, well, our, like, this is the, uh, so very briefly, like, um, our closest protestan relatives are called coenoflagellates. And so basically you have, uh, they look like our, our sperm cells, basically, with, like, with an extra little collar of flagella. So these guys are, uh, these are our closest protestan relatives, and basically you get them together, you stick them together, uh, and can shuttle, um, in like you know information uh, proteins and stuff back and forth between them and then that's how you you get very primitive multicellularity in like sponges right and then you just kind of build on that build up different tissues and stuff like that and that's how you get your other organisms like nadarians and dickinsonia and icaria and such a ridiculous name all these other guys which one dickinsonia yeah i, I don't know the um the etymology for that name sorry uh uh, uh, like it, scientists and their names like the sonic hedgehog gene yeah yeah true um and here's a whole bunch of other um bioterians so kimberellas lophotrogozoan nomicolathus uh, lophoferata is like brachiopods and bryozoan so he's a member of that group dina is probably an annelid and then eulingia is probably a panarthropod so the earliest ancestors of like like velvet worms and tardigrades mm-hmm. and arthropods was this little wormy guy. I love yeah. tardigrades. At this point, we are at the the cusp of the Cambrian explosion. Let me do. Is that it? So, um, we are dealing with these very small, basically segmented bilaterian animals, like Acaria. Mm-hmm. So. So we go on that end, and then the other way, and so from there, so we're at 540, I think, oh, I dropped it, I see what I did. Um, Let me share my screen again, sorry. 
Um, so we are now in the Pale in the Paleozoic about 542 million years ago. Um, and we have so as you saw on the other chart, oxygen is rising. Mm -hmm. Um, and the uh, so oxygen rising. And I don't remember what the exact reason for that was, but. That means organisms can get larger because they can get larger. They can, um, some can become predators. Some can be, you know, passive filter feeders. And now you have this building up of ecosystems because some of them are becoming predators. And as a result, if there are predators, you also need to have anti-predator defenses, right? So organisms adapt in turn all sorts of spikes and uh, oh. shells and other hard parts for defense. Awesome. And this is where we start seeing like evolutionary arms races mm -hmm. because of this sort of stuff. The, the increase in oxygen, you can get larger, means you can fill different niches, and that causes evolutionary arms races in turn. And then again, we're off to the races. And so suddenly things can get spiny and shelly and, and have hard parts and all this sort of stuff. And so here's um, you know, Octoyo, which is a group. Because your cells have more energy. Right, exactly. Uh, okay. Yeah, exactly. Your cells can produce more energy. So you have the ability to use that energy to make more things. Right. Yeah, so now we're starting to get larger. Like, uh, Anomalocaris is like a whole meter long. He was a big boy. Opapinia... These are all early arthropods. So you start seeing these guys show up in the Cambrian. Um, Opabinia and Anomalocaris and Kalentia are not true arthropods. They're called stem arthropods, but trilobites are actual arthropods. Now, that um, op Opabinia, does that huh? have like a proboscis or what is that? It looks like a tongue. Yeah. Okay. It is. It's like this weird proboscis that's kind of, that it uses to like grab and eat things. It's very strange. Cool. Almost looks like Very it's using it like an antenna or something, uh, or just to like feel out if there's food. And that's really cool. I, I didn't I didn't know that uh, these are these arthropods. So they're they're close. So Opabinia, Anomalocaris, and Kalentia are like outside of arthropods, but they're close to arthropods. These guys are what you call stem arthropods, or you might call them transitional fossils. Oh, so these guys. So the thing that like Stephen Meyer won't tell you and other intelligent design guys is Cambrian is full of these stem arthropods. These guys which are not quite arthropods yet, but they're very close. Don't see and the earliest arth like true arthropods you see are trilobites. As for the modern groups that we have, the first members of those groups don't show up until the late Cambrian. Um what do you mean most by, of the Cambrian by stem? What is what do you mean by that? So there are these two terms called crown and stem in okay. phylogenetics. Crown means the last common ancestor of all the modern group of all the modern or extant groups. So if we're talking about arthropods, so spiders and scorpions, millipedes and centipedes, crustaceans and insects, those are all crown groups because they're all extant and the common ancestor all of them today, those are all crown members. Anything okay. that falls outside that common ancestor is called a stem member. It's a stem arthropod. So Calentia, Anomalocaris, and Opabinia evolved branched off before the last common ancestor of all extant arthropods. Okay. Wow, I'm learning so much. Same with, so if I go back to the slide... So with these guys, um, Hallucigenia is a stem onychophoran. It's a stem velvet worm. Wow. So it evolved before first velvet worms, the common ancestor, before the last common ancestor of all modern velvet worms is okay. when it okay. branched off. Same with Wawaxia and with Halkiaria. Actually, yeah, same with Wawaxia. No, I think Halkiaria is a crown mollusk, but Wawaxia is a stem mollusk. Okay. Branched off before the last common ancestor of all extant mollusks. And so here's a here's a chart showing that. So you have Kimberella way down here on the bottom right. What is a stem Lophotrochozoan or stem mollusk, as we said earlier? Kiaria is an early crown mollusk. 
we have some other early crown mollusks like this uh, early bivalve uh, babinka, then early cephalopods, etc. So yeah, and then so these are all so everything from right here it says uh, this one little spot right here. Everything from here on up to today, those are all crown members, not stem members. So the stem members are the transitional fossils that creationists ask for and they're here we already have lots of them they're all over the place right you know? but for our lineage remember kimberella kimberella uh, ikaria sorry was a little small wormy guy mm -hmm. again we're still kind of looking at so this just says worm this is like a hemichordate the acorn worms you still have little wormy guys and we have these early chordates the chordate Chordata is the phylum we're in. So they have a means they have a Not yet, no. Oh. So Chordata means you have a pushed anal tail, pharyngeal arches, um, a dorsal hollow nerve cord, and a notochord. Those are the characteristics that chordates have. Okay. So you have like a spinal cord, but no spine yet. Got it. Um, you have these... So lancelets, those are still alive today. Pekaya was is an early lancelet. So oh, he looks still pretty wormy, doesn't he? He doesn't look really fishy yet, you know? Kind of looks like a leaf. It kind of does look like a leaf. Uh, same with Haikuella. Again, really kind of wormy, not really fishy. Then by the time you get to Haikuichthys, this is like our early fish. This is an actual vertebrate, Haikuichthys. Doesn't really look super fishy, does he? <laughs> he's getting there. I, he's working on it, but he, he's not not quite there yet. Then you have like actual fish. So we have this really nice transition, transitional sequence from chordates, one hand, which is still alive today. So we're not directly descended from hemichordates, but our ancestor was hemichordate-like through lancelets, their ancient relatives, through other ancient forms our very first actual fish so again really good transitional sequence so now we're going to jump ahead to the next period which is called the ordovician or ordovician i've heard it pronounced different ways so if you look down here at the bottom this little guy erandaspus uh, so again doesn't have like dorsal fin he's still just kind of kind of sleek like our other uh like hykuichthys and so then we have a diversification of fish in the, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> in the Ordovician and the Silurian. These guys are diversifying, and then we get our very first Osteichthians, which includes us. The split between the Osteichthians and the, um, and the, uh, uh, so Osteichthians are the bony fish. So that's like all the ray finned fish and the lobe finned fish. That's them together. And the Chondrichthians, which are the sharks, skates, and rays, their group, that split occurred in the late Ordovician. And then you get the radiation of Osteichthians, which includes us. So those are our fishy ancestors in the Solarian. So we're going to skip ahead to the Solarian. So just for instance, so this is Giyu. I have no idea how to pronounce that correctly. So Giyu is an early lobe finned fish. But the early lobe finned fish also look like the early ray finned fish. So lobe finned fish are just lungfish, uh, lungfish, coelacanths, and and tetrapods, so including us. Whereas ray finned fish are like all the other fish you can think of. Right? Like carp, bass, uh, you know, flounder. Basically every fish you can think of that isn't either a coelacanth or lungfish is a is a ray finned fish. And then, of course, your cartilaginous fish. So those are the shark, skates, and rays group. So this is Neuropisicanthes. Neuropisicanthus, sorry. Um, so, Jackson. So, um, sorry. Good. I yes. just wanted to say, um, in, I, I, there was probably another thing I wanted to ask you about. Um, so I, oh. I don't want to take up too much time because I, I feel like, you know, we could go all the way to, you know, modern day with this. But I think, I feel like we, like, uh, like we get the point here. Like, cause, cause really we're just going to show the transition between this and what, like something like TikTok and just keep moving on and on and on. And in fact, that was the next, yeah, that was yeah. my next little 
because I additional sequence. So yeah, we, there you go. when you were when you were talking about the backbones, it reminded me of um, an exchange I had with my debate with Ken Hovind that, and I was wondering if I could share my screen and show you some oh, yeah, uh, a little bit sharing, of this. Yeah, because yeah, I would love I would love to see what you how you would have answered this better because I I felt like I didn't do a great job in this exchange. So let me share my screen real quick. And uh, I'm just going to show you this little section because what it was was that um, we were talking about the... I brought up the law of monophyly because Ken mm. always says... He always says we've never seen a dog produce a non-dog, which is his biggest, most foundational straw man. And, you know, we, we don't... Evolution doesn't yeah. say that. Evolution doesn't say that a dog gave birth to like a cat or something. So I told him that the law of monophyly says that this isn't possible and we got and we got into the topic of an a, a animal with a backbone um being related to an animal or an animal without a backbone being related to one with a backbone and he was asking me if all animals are in their same clade then how can that happen and it was tough for me to answer this one so i'm gonna i'm gonna show you this exchange if that's okay and then uh, i'll uh, get your thoughts on it does that sound good can you, uh, see, can you see my screen, too? Okay, I'm going to play this. Many of the textbooks, I got them right here beside me here. This isn't science. This is propaganda. The burden of proof is on you tonight. Where's the evidence for evolution? You can hear that, right? I can hear it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where's the evidence of any animal or plant ever producing babies that were different than itself? And to say it happens too slowly to see, you're admitting there's no evidence. Well, there's no evidence of dogs giving birth to cats. I'll admit that because that's what you seem to think evolution is. Evolution doesn't suggest that an animal like a dog will give birth to something like a cat because of an evolutionary law called the law of monophyly. Animals are always going to be in the same category that every one of their ancestors was. That's okay, like good. I said, why a vertebrate is always going to produce a vertebrate. Well, hold it. Amoebas don't have backbones at all. Somewhere along the line, the single cell creatures without a backbone produced a backbone. So your law no. monophyly, you're talking out of both sides of your face here, which is. No, no. <laughs> that's that's no. OK, so he says the, that there was a single celled organism that didn't have a backbone, which produced a single celled organism with a backbone. And that's ludicrous. Well, um, absolutely ludicrous. Remember that when he says produce, he means an animal giving birth to another animal. But I, I'm going to why don't we'll we'll save your comments for when I finish playing the clip. OK, because I feel like, you know, it, it's so ridiculous that you're going to have an outburst every few seconds if I, <laughs> if I do it otherwise. OK, is it is the animal that never has a backbone like an amoeba or a single cell creature going to somehow produce one with a backbone now? Which is it, AJ? No, I, like I said, the very first single-celled organisms were not amoeba. They were eukaryotic single-celled organisms. I should have, I should have said prokaryotic. And if you go down the line to humans, humans are still eukaryotes. So okay, just wait, wait, like wait. every one of did its that, ancestors was a eukaryote. Did that first single-celled creature, whether it be amoeba or whatever you want to call it, did it, did it have a backbone? Did the single-celled creature have a backbone? Did a single-celled organism have a spine? Did no, the original... Kent, it didn't. The single-celled organism didn't have a spine. Good. But you think it turned into a creature like us with a spine. No, I don't. Well, that's what I you just said. I don't think it said. turned into anything. It doesn't transform into a human. You seem to think that well, a single-celled organism can magically shapeshift into a full-blown human. The law of monophyly says they stay within their same clade or whatever word you want to use. Well, the one without a backbone didn't stay there, did he? He grew a backbone somewhere over millions and billions of generations. So the law of monophyly, which is it? Do you believe the law of monophyly or do you believe in evolution? Okay. You can... Okay. So the, the central, the problem that Kent does not seem to understand is he seems to think that monophyly works both ways. So oh, monophyly works in one direction. It's the ancestor. Or sorry, it's, it's it, from ancestors to descendants. It's not descendants to ancestors. The way that I would explain that is, 
First of all, no. <laughs> no single-celled organisms have a backbone, and no, they never produced a single-celled organism that had a backbone, because that's ridiculous. Um, you could say, again, I, you could say at one point, if we give in to, to Kent's ludicrous n narrative that at one point there was like a fish that didn't have a backbone that gave birth to a fish with a backbone, the fish that has the backbone is still in the same clade as its ancestor. It is also, you could say, the progenitor of a new clade that's still monophyletic. It's not jumping between clades, right? That's the way that I think you should ex explain it to him is it's ancestor to descendant, not descendant to ancestor. That's how monophyly works. Yeah. Well, every descendant is in the same clade as its ancestor, but not every ancestor is in all of the same clades as its descendants. Right. He seems to think that if, if I'm saying that, that every animal is going to be in the same clades as its ancestors, that means that if an animal has a backbone, every single one of its ancestors had to have a backbone. That's what he seems to think. No, that's just wrong. That's not how monophyly works. Yeah. See, that's the thing about these type of debates. It's like you have these questions that they're almost hard to answer because they're so ridiculous. And it's like, I know that I'm right, but it's hard to put it into words in a way that um, it's hard, to, almost hard to explain it, you know, because mm, yeah. I don't know the law of monophyly or any of this stuff as well as you do. You know, I I fully admit that, you know, I'm a layman. I enjoy I consider evolution debates on YouTube to be strictly entertainment. They're not scientific debates. This is not settling any type of science. You're right. And so yeah. um, I, I enjoy debating just for the sake of it and because I want to get more experience at it and I like the challenge of it. But I, I sometimes struggle with exchanges like this where the creationists, they'll ask questions. It's almost like you could have a question that's difficult because it's a hard question because it's well, it's like a smart question. And you can have a question that's difficult because it's so dumb. <laughs> if that makes right. sense. Right. You have to, you basically have to sift through all the like assumed premises and like suss out the different layers of how wrong it is. Right. Yeah. No, I, I get that. I've, you see that sort of stuff with, a lot of creationist literature where they'll sneak in these premises and say, well, how do you explain this? You have to pause and be like, hold on, the question itself is malformed. You can't, yes. it doesn't make any sense for me to even answer this because you're assuming these things that are all wrong. It's tears of wrong. It's fractally wrong. Yeah, you know? or, or it's like, that's not even wrong. <laughs> this isn't even right. It's not even wrong. Yeah. Right, exactly. Well, Yeah, you get a lot of that stuff in creationism. Um, you know? I... Uh, I really appreciate you coming on, Jackson, and, and teaching, being my middle school teacher. Um, I wanted to tell you about a funny thing that happened in the Q&A of the Maddox debate yesterday. Somebody asked, why isn't Standing for Truth's book about ERVs in the uh, academic literature or, or, in, or in science papers yet? They asked uh, LPP this, and he was saying, well, it only uh, got published like two months ago, right? Just, you know. Like, give it some time, basically. And I I was just cracking up, like, because I knew he was going to say that. I just thought that was really funny. But how would you publish toilet paper in a scientific journal? That's what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be like vandalizing it. Well, um, thank, so you. thank you for doing this, Jackson. Thank you. Absolutely. And if you ever want to have a, a chat again about any of this stuff, then yeah, happy to do so. Awesome. Well, um, you know, I will put your links in the description of this video. And, um, you know, I, I hope that um, anybody watching got as much out of this as I did, because I feel like I learned quite a bit. You know, you um, you're so knowledgeable on these topics, you know, and that's why I like to sort of pick your brain on these things. Um, but what's going uh, on I mean, with you? Like, I'm OK, I guess <laughs> <laughs> you're you're modest. What's going on with your channel? Like, what have you been what have you been doing and like what are you doing like in in your your education and stuff like what's up with you uh, well on the channel right now um a series that i'm doing is uh called the ancestors tale series so there's a really my favorite book not just by richard dawkins my favorite um non-fiction book is the ancestors tale by dawkins and wong and so i decided to do a series analyzing it 
essentially chapter by chapter. And so I am uh, 17 videos into this series now. Wow. I believe, yeah, I've, I've um, seen some of those videos. They're really good. It's um, so yeah, we were so after 17 videos, we are finally about uh, 75 million years ago. So we're in the late Cretaceous. <laughs> um, it's it's just now finally left the primates, basically. Um, yeah, I, I'm really enjoying this series because, and this is another thing. Like, I want this to be a major um reference base for how evolution works because this series is going to go all the way back to the last universal common ancestor I go all the way back to, to the start of it all so and you will be able to watch and this really extreme depth the evolution of different organisms so right like i have the first eight episodes are just about the evolution of humans from both from like a population genetic standpoint and uh looking at like gene trees and then uh, looking at the different species of fossil hominins. So you get all of that in this like super depth. Um, so it's I'm having a lot of fun with it. I really enjoy the series and it's, I'm excited um, to go through it. Um, academically, I'm still working on my, um, my master's degree in uh, organismal biology. I just say zoology. Usually it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, my hope with is to be done with that by next semester. Um, so that, and then go back for my PhD. Fun stuff. <laughs> wow, well, that's very really, really impressive. I wish you the best of luck with all of that. You know, I think I think you'll do great. Hey, here's hoping, right? <laughs> here's hoping. Yeah. You know, I I just think I'm just glad that um, YouTube exists and has these type of resources on them because. I, you know, I live in Texas. So when I was in high school, they didn't have evolution in the curriculum. So I didn't really learn about this stuff until much later when I found channels like R and Raw and yours and like mm. Dapper Dino and Dr. Dan. So uh, yeah. I feel like I'm playing catch up a little bit about this stuff. So, you know, I'm and that's why I feel like these a lot of these creationists, they really have no excuse with such a great resource like the Internet. How have you guys still not like got with the program yet you know well a lot of them have been duped by people who they consider to be experts hmm. and the people who are doing the duping are just dishonest or disingenuous um and you know it is what it is rj and i have written a whole book on this uh, now um we're working on the second one so uh there's that uh if you also want like a hammer on evolution i do also have like a whole powerpoint on that too so if you want to do that happy to talk about that and and provide you with references for like different evolution experiments that you, you might find interesting that yeah that might be good or slides i could use in a debate so you absolutely so you guys wrote the rocks were there is there a second book in that series yet we're working on that currently yeah okay and so i i hope that you guys will still consider my title of too fast too igneous for the name of the sequel book <laughs> <laughs> uh think about it that's an rj that's an rj question he's okay. our our uh artistic person <laughs> okay all right well i guess with that i'm gonna i'm gonna sign off jackson's but uh yeah thank you thank you for uh coming on yeah absolutely anytime anytime all right okay